like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHUS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you very much for tuning into my show this morning. We are going to be talking about central banking and money on the show today. Money is the core of the economy. There are no trades that really go on without money being involved. There's some small barter going on here and there. Maybe if I have some eggs, I bring it over to somebody's house and they give me a meal or something like that. But in terms of the real economic exchange that's happening in the world today, one half of almost every single exchange is money. And therefore, money is very important. And it's important for the oligarchs to get their hands on the control of the supply of money. This has always been the case throughout time. We've seen uh, emperors uh, grab all of the money and use a legal tender that they put their stamp on, they put their uh, their image on. Uh, this happened back in the Roman time periods, where the rulers would collect all the cash from the uh, society. They would slowly clip off little pieces of the metal, or they would melt it down, and they would reform the coins uh, using less of the precious metals in, inside of the coins. And this was called inflation. Once the coins went back into circulation, uh, they were worth less. But the government was saying, you have to use them as if they were worth the same amount. And so prices went up. Inflation occurred because of the lower valued money being recirculated in the economy as higher valued money. And this is exactly what's happening in the world today, with central banks printing their own money and adding this new cash into the economy uh, through even just an electronic payment system. They just introduce all this new money and send it flying about to different producers, and then this sends price signals out to people where they are um, going to spend more money on the commodities because there is uh, the same amount of goods, but there are now more dollar bills chasing those same goods. You see, when the central bank prints money, it doesn't actually add anything of value to the economy. It's not like it's building tables or, you know, building birdhouses or making uh, big steel buildings or uh, construction vehicles or anything really that uh, creates new goods in the economy. All they do is print new money. And of course, the people who receive that money first can spend it on stuff in the economy. But sooner or later, the economy realizes that no new value has been added by those new dollars put into the market. And so what happens is only the exchange ratio is disrupted. And the exchange ratio is just a price. So the price of goods is disrupted. And when you print more money, uh, you end up getting higher prices. This is called inflation. And people think that inflation just means higher prices. But no, actually, it means that the central bank introduced new money into the economy, which caused higher prices. Now, one of the consequences to this, and there are myriad consequences to this, but one of them is that the people who have saved their money, who have set aside their money for a rainy day and put money away for when they knew that they would need it in the future, these people are punished by the inflation, by the introduction of new money into the economy. When they had saved their money, the the time that they put that money away, the money was worth more than what it is in the future. So let's say that you set aside $100,000 20 years ago. Well, that money is not worth a whole lot today compared to what it could have bought back when you saved it. And so people who saved their money, people who were very frugal and didn't want to spend tons of money all at once, actually face consequences. And those people who are spendthrift, who just run out and grab everything on the store and spend their entire paycheck, these people are encouraged to continue with their kind of behavior. So the idea behind capitalism is that you save your money, you put it aside, and you wait until you have some capital saved up, and then you invest it into the economy by building capital goods, by building things that uh, help us to produce rather than, you know, consume stuff in the moment. And so when savers face consequences and face punishment for saving, then you're going to find that fewer people are saving. And that is, in reality, what's occurring. So the interest rate is supposed to fluctuate based on how much people are saving. But because the central bank distorts 
the interest rate by uh, creating new money, then we find that producers are led to believe that people are saving more than they actually are. Whereas the interest rate is telling savers not to save because there's not as much return on their investment for saving. So for producers, they see that there's a lot of savings because that's what the interest rate tells them. And for savers, it says, don't save. That's a bad idea. Spend all your money right now. And so what happens is we get a breakdown in the communication between producers and consumers. So they are not on the same page. The information network that is prices and the free market system breaks down when the government gets involved and starts distorting things as it does through its central bank. So let's talk a little bit about savings. Uh, Sean Rittenor wrote an article on the Mises Daily uh, saying, why is the Fed punishing my parents? In September 1993, President Bill Clinton reassured his radio audience that, quote, if you work hard and play by the rules, you'll be rewarded with a good life for yourself and a better chance for your children. Picking up that theme over 18 years later, President Barack Obama affirmed that, quote, Americans who work hard and play by the rules every day deserve a government and a financial system that does the same. The trouble is neither the government nor the financial system, backed by the Federal Reserve, rewards people like my parents, who have worked hard and played by the rules their entire lives, only to have their savings wither away. Instead, Federal Reserve officials and intelligentsia who support them are continuously working to make their lives more difficult, frightening the masses of what shoppers look for every day, lower prices. Price deflation, the cry, is disastrous for the economy. They worry that lower prices will reduce profits, leading to shutdowns and layoffs, and that lower prices make it harder for people to pay their debts. Sound economic theory and history, however, both indicate that price deflation is nothing the social economy needs to fear. If prices fall because the economy is more productive, this is unambiguously positive. However, if prices fall because people spend less, their desire is for larger real cash balances. Falling prices help them achieve their goal, which is precisely the purpose of economic activity. Lower prices and wage rates can make it harder to pay fixed debt. This, however, serves as an excellent incentive to stay out of debt in the first place, as my parents have done as a result of significant sacrifice. Before creating even more money out of thin air to ward off lower overall prices, we should at least consider some of the ethical issues involved. Many men from my father's generation are not unlike John Adams, who wrote to his wife that he, quote, must study politics and war, that our sons may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. My father embarked for 20 years of hard labor in a meat packing plant providing for his family until he lost his job due to his union pricing him and his fellow workers out of a job. When his plant closed in the mid-1980s, he embarked on a second successful career with my mother, operating their own barbecue business for another 20-plus years. I saw firsthand the challenges they faced trying to keep quality up and costs down while producing top-drawer barbecue, meat, and sandwiches for a demand that was always uncertain. I saw the stress on my mother's face one week in the early days when they netted a mere $15 before taxes. My father indeed studied meat packing and barbecue, in, in part so I could go to college and become an economist and college professor. Additionally, mom and dad had the foresight and character to make the sacrifices necessary to stay out of debt. Indeed, they are Paul Krugman's worst nightmare, a family determined not to live beyond their means. Now retired, like many in their generation, they are enjoying life the best they can on an almost fixed income. Because they have no debt, they have been able to live without tremendous economic hardship thus far. The Federal Reserve's inflationism, however, increasingly makes life for them more difficult as steady price inflation daily chips away at their livelihood. Since 2009, for example, the consumer price index has increased over 9%. This masks, however, significantly larger price increases for important necessities. Prices of dairy products are up almost 17% since 2009. Gasoline prices are up almost 11% despite the recent decline. 
Prices for meat, poultry, fish, and eggs have increased a whopping 26% since 2009. Higher overall prices do not help people like my parents at all. They instead act as a thief, snatching wealth away from them in the form of diminished purchasing power. What they long for is to see the value of their savings increase. Far from creating economic hardship for them, lower overall prices would be a boon. Both sound economics and ethics, therefore, demand that we give up the anti-deflation rhetoric and the inflation it fuels. Charity demands that we cease striking fear into the hearts of the masses, softening them up for ever higher prices. The Federal Reserve should stop punishing people like my parents who have worked hard and played by the rules their whole lives. After all, what did they ever do to Greenspan, Bernanke, and Yellen? That article was written by Sean Rittenor, and it's called Why is the Fed Punishing My Parents? You can read it online at the Mises Institute, M-I-S-E-S dot org. Now, we know that the central banks and governments hate gold and silver. Not only does it put restrictions on the banks so that they couldn't actually print more money, but it also causes the uh, government to restrain itself as well. You can't go into debt and take out tons of money if that money does not actually exist. And so when you have a hard currency such as gold and silver, you have a specific amount of uh, that particular good in the economy, and therefore you can't create new portions of it out of thin air. So, uh, you know, imagine me going into the store and saying, I'd like to purchase this thing. I don't actually have any money, but poof, I will make you some gold out of thin air. Uh, I don't think that they'd actually do any exchanges with you. They would probably just usher you out of the store. And yet that is what the government claims to be able to do as it prints new money and introduces new money in the forms of electronic holdings in banks' accounts. And so while cash, in terms of Federal Reserve notes, the pieces of paper that we use to exchange uh, in our daily lives, while that is not gold and silver, I mean, you can print new dollars and introduce them into the economy. What happens is the banks have to spend money. They have to do the printing press. They have to get ink. You have to print $100 all at a time. And so as inflation occurs and it increases the, um, the prices in the economy, you have to print more in order to get the job done. And so they want to get away from cash. They certainly want to uh, create an all-electronic type of economy where every single exchange is logged into a computer and then you have record of it. Um, they can also use this to track people to find out more about their uh, expenses and like what they're spending stuff on. They can uh, get more tax dollars because they have record of it and they can go back and look all of that stuff up. And so, of course, they would want to attack cash. And a short blog post is going to sum this up by Joseph T. Salerno. He says, uh, the war against cash has, up to now, been waged almost exclusively by national governments and official international organizations, although there are exceptions. Now the war has acquired a powerful new ally in Chase, the largest bank in the U.S. and a subsidiary of J.P. Morgan Chase & Company, according to Forbes, the world's third largest public company. Of course, it is hardly surprising that a crony capitalist fractional reserve bank, which received $25 billion in bailout loans from the U.S. Treasury, should want to curry favor with its regulators and political masters, and in the process ensure its own stability by helping to stamp out the use of cash. For the very existence of cash places the power over fractional reserve banks squarely in the hands of their depositors, who may withdraw their cash in any amount and at any time, bringing even the mightiest bank to its knees literally overnight. What is a surprise is how little notice the rollout of Chase's new policy has received. As of March, Chase began restricting the use of cash in selected markets, including Greater Cleveland. The new policy restricts borrowers from using cash to make the payments on credit cards, mortgages, equity lines, and auto loans. Chase even goes so far as to prohibit the storage of cash in its safe deposit boxes. In a letter to its customers dated April 1, 2015, pertaining to its, quote, updated safe deposit box lease agreement, 
One of the highlighted items reads, quote, You agree not to store any cash or coins other than those found to have a collectible value. Whether or not this pertains to gold and silver coins with no numismatic value is not explained. As one observer commented, quote, This policy is unusual, but since Chase is the nation's largest bank, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing more of this in this era of sensitivity about funding terrorists and other illegal causes. You can bet on it. That article was by Joseph T. Salerno talking about the war on cash. So, what are some of the solutions that we could put in place to relieve the problems caused by central banking? I think that part of the answer to this question lies in the definition of central banks themselves. So, a central bank is a private institution that has been granted a government monopoly and granted special privileges and favors to be the organization that conducts all affairs with regards to money. It creates the new money, it maintains the supply of the currency that is currently circulating, it tells all the banks within its cartel uh, what it is that they can do, how much they can keep in their reserves, and it makes all of these uh, grandiose decisions about money in the economy. However, a free market would dictate that you would have a free and competing set of currencies that people would pick and choose based on what they'd prefer. So some people might uh, prefer to have a gold and silver for their currency. Others might use a different commodity. Uh, Some people might have banks that issue notes that maybe their part of their reserve would would still be there. Maybe they wouldn't have the entirety of the gold and silver there, but they would still issue notes. But so long as you have competition and you have different banks offering different solutions, then you don't get this top-down central bank, we control all of the money. So we just have a free market. We have money that is uh, offered, that you can purchase, that you can buy, that you can sell with, and there are no restrictions on new companies entering into the market and providing the uh, service of minting money. But of course, if you try to supply a competing currency in the market, you will most likely be arrested because, again, the Federal Reserve is a monopoly and cannot tolerate competitors to it because then its fraud will be revealed uh, for what it actually is. And so I would like to read an article kind of outlining what happens when you try to provide a alternative currency. And uh, this is a, it happened a little while ago. This was back in 2011. But I think it's still relevant to our chat today. And uh, Lou H. Rockwell Jr. is going to talk about this in his article, Use the Dollar or Else. Look up the phrase, quote, a unique form of domestic terrorism on a search engine, and you will turn up a story about a man whom the U.S. government is trying to cage from now until the time of his death. And his crime? His unique form of terrorism? He minted silver and copper coins and sold them. In other words, he did what innumerable entrepreneurs from the beginning of time have done. He attempted to provide consumers with a store of value. No one was forced to buy. He met a market demand, and that's it. Whom did he hurt? No one. Unlike illegal drugs, which the government bans on grounds that it doesn't want us to hurt ourselves, these silver coins did not endanger their users. They only gave people an option on what to do with their money. Did the proprietor attempt to claim that these were legal tender for monetary exchange? No, he sold them for what they are. Could people use them for money? Yes, but people can use anything for money. Shoes, shells, flash drives, or books. Whether something is money or not depends on the intentions behind the exchange. Do you acquire something to consume it? Then it is not money. Do you acquire something in order to trade it for something else? In that case, it takes on money-like properties. It is wholly understandable that people have doubts about the future of the paper dollar. Many people are seeking alternatives in their own financial interest. What this proprietor did was provide something that turned out to be a possible alternative to the dollar. And for that, and that alone, he is being hounded and destroyed. His name is Bernard von Nothaus, and he is 67 years old. 
In the course of the proceedings, he was called every name imaginable. He was called a crook, a terrorist, a crank, and a crazy man. What he actually did, however, should be fully legal and encouraged in any nation in all times and all places. A nation that is confident about its money's future would not fear currency competition. A nation with a dying money uses every possible means to crush the competition. That is precisely what is happening in the case of the so-called liberty dollar. What's striking here is that no one believes that there is any reason to argue the point. It is obvious to his persecutors that he is a criminal. Quote, he's playing on a core idea of the radical right, that evil bankers in the Federal Reserve are ripping you off by controlling the money supply, said Mark Potok of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Quote, he very much exists in the world of anti-government patriot movement, whatever he may say. That's who his customers are. And what is the interest of the SLPC in this case? This is a group that claims to be about stopping hate and racism, and this has something to do with opposing poverty. And yet here they are intervening in a case in which a man is actually trying to prevent people from being impoverished. As for the Fed, it is not exactly an act of hate to point out that the Fed controls the money supply. Bernanke himself admits this. The government has made no bones about the foundation of its case. Citing a Civil War era law, prosecutors say that it is a crime to compete with the official dollar. Note that they are not citing the U.S. Constitution, which nowhere prevents such a thing. In fact, private coinage has a rich history in the United States. It was essential when the West was being settled. Providing coinage services was as common as any other trade. But since 1971, when the dollar became all paper, there has been a sense that its viability needs the backing of federal guns in order to thrive. This attitude is inconsistent with freedom. The right of private coinage is an essential part of free enterprise. Currency competition, especially in a digital age, is something that every country needs. As Seth Lipsky wrote in the Wall Street Journal, Quote, certainly it's a loser's game to suppress private money that is sound in order to protect government-issued money that is unsound. Precisely. As Lipsky points out, Nothaus operated very close to the line in terms of legality. He put the dollar sign on his coins, for example, and sold them with numbers. I can't comment on his business dealings or the integrity of his operations, but this much is clear. The grounds on which he is being hounded are egregious and tyrannical. Allowing for alternative currencies is not terrorism. It is a path to monetary reform, merely an application of the principle of free enterprise to a sector that should have never fallen so completely to government control. The people who are working to provide alternatives should not be jailed. They should be celebrated in every country that values freedom. So that article was by Lou H. Rockwell Jr., and it was called Use the Dollar or Else. And of course, it was written a while ago. It was written back in 2011 when uh, Von Nothaus was printing the Liberty Dollar, and he was just printing silver coins and selling them out into the world as a competing currency. And yet the government came and arrested him for doing so. And uh, even today, we don't really have any competing currencies in our economy, although there are these funny things called bitcoins online, and uh, people are basically transferring bits of data back and forth to each other, and this represents a certain dollar denomination, right? So you uh, send per, uh, somebody a 0 .001 of a bitcoin, and they get that value, and then they can go and spend that bitcoin on something else. So it, it is a currency. Uh, it's just not widely kind of accepted. You can't just walk into a normal retail store and just uh, use your Bitcoin there. But um, Bitcoin does have a lot of the key characteristics that we are looking at when we're talking about money. So for a money to be considered as a money, uh, it has to be divisible. 
So that means that we can take it and we can cut it down into little pieces. Um, gold and silver have been historically very good at this uh, because you can just take the gold and you can melt it down and you can reform it into a new form without losing too much of its value. Unfortunately, diamonds are not like this because as soon as you start chipping away at the diamond, you can't reform it and it loses a lot of its value because it's a lot smaller now. And so we want it to be divisible. We also want uh, the money to be fungible. That means that you can exchange one for the other. So, you know, you put the coin in a, in a big pile of coins, you can mix it all up and you can take one. And as long as it's the same weight and the same kind of craftsmanship and the same markings on it, then uh, each one is equal to the other one. And uh, Bitcoin, again, uh, has this particular characteristic to it. Um, one Bitcoin is equal to one Bitcoin, no matter whose computer that Bitcoin is uh, stored on. Another characteristic of money that's very important is that it has a very stable supply to it. So we saw the dangers earlier of having an unstable supply where the government can just create new money out of thin air. Uh, this causes a lot of price distortion. It causes the interest rates to be out of step with producers and consumers. Um, there's all sorts of consequences that occur when you have a floating supply of money. That's why gold and silver were so good because they were very stable. They had a very solid uh, supply and you can't just make new money out of thin air. Bitcoin also has a very stable, solid supply. There's only a certain number of them that will ever be created on the planet so that the supply will never get out of control and prices uh, will not get out of control. You see, we always want to determine the value of other goods. We, we don't really necessarily want the value of money to change too much. Uh, it should remain fairly constant because that way we can see what the other goods actually are evaluated at in the economy. So we want to know the value of beef and steel and iron and uh, grain and corn and food and, you know, all of the stuff that we want to actually ascertain what value those goods are. We don't necessarily want to have to worry about the value of money fluctuating all over the place. And there are, of course, quite a few other uh, characteristics that we look for in a money. One is portability. Uh, one is a high value for the amount of weight that you have to bring over to the person that you're buying stuff from. Uh, there's a lot of different characteristics that we look for. But this would all be taken into consideration in a competing currency market. People would look at all the different characteristics of all the different monies that they would be able to choose from. And then they would choose the one that was best suited for them. And so in that way, made the best money win. All we say is that if the government money is so good, then why don't we just have competition in the money markets and then it would win out because it's the best one, right? But because they make it illegal to introduce alternative currencies into the market, we never will know whether or not it's a good money or a bad money. And in fact, it's actually probably going to be the case that it's a bad money because you, you wouldn't have to protect it if it was a good money. So I hope that you enjoyed this show. This has been an episode of the Austrian Circle, and uh, we'll be back next week for another episode. Have a great week. Take care.